Hi, Johan. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just, 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 No? no? There we go. I can hear you. Okay. Um, good. But I took that back. Uh, do you have any interference or is it good? Sorry? Is the sound, is the sound good? Sound is good. Nah, yeah, okay. this, this frame is good too. Okay. Um, I just want to quickly check on the PowerPoint thing. Okay. I'm trying to, can you just check the PowerPoint? Thing? Yes, it's, it's working. In, but okay, but can you see the PowerPoint, Gary? Not yet. Yes, now I can see. Okay. The only problem is I can't see you. Just go there to that share button. Just yeah, share. Um. <coughs> Good. Why is this not full screen? I'm trying to see what's going on. Um, We're nearly good, Gary. Just give us a few seconds. No worries, no worries. Take your time. Stop screen. I'll share my screen. Um, Um, can you see the PowerPoint on the split screen? Uh, not yet. Can see your screen. Can you, you just go there down? There is a share screen. You have to just press the share. Screen. Yeah. No. Yeah, I can see your email. So go to the presentation now. Okay. Presentation. No, so this is the screen that you're seeing. So you're, seeing, you're seeing this screen. Yeah. So go to the presentation here and put it up here. This should be the screen that you're seeing. Now. Right, yeah, just go to the presentation now. We can see your screen. Bring that one this way. So. Right, again. Yeah, yeah, we can see your presentation. Okay, that's good. That's good. Perfect. We'll go to the beginning. Yeah. Good stuff. So let me just see. Am I? Any okay. problems? I can't see Gary here. You have to get Gary there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, anyway, my I, I, my uh, frame, my video will disappear. So you see yourself and uh, the presentation. That's all. I'm going okay. to introduce you and disappear. <laughs> right. I'm good. Okay, good. Hello, guys, again, welcome back. Um, so, like I mentioned in the morning, why we in this session from five different continents, people are talking about their experience, their snakes, their biodiversity, and as well as dealing with uh, uh, the tropical neglected disease, that's the snake bites in the world. I don't know how many of them saw the recent paper by Nelson, where he talks about the and his uh, co-authors talking about uh, the present situation in India. Here, almost 50,000 people died due to snake bites in India. And uh, over the 20 years, they've calculated 1.2 million people have died due to a snake bite. That's a huge number. So on that um, occasion, we thought today is a snake, snake day celebration in the world without of bringing the experts from five different con continents talking about their experience and snakes. So here, sitting in India or Southeast Asia, anywhere in the world, trying to learn more about other species, particularly African 
snake one of my favorites i'm sure many uh many of my herpetological friends my friends i mean my snake snake guys in india love those snakes in africa johan so today we have johan johan marias is a CEO. oh it's a good morning for you right yeah good morning gary how are you doing good good guy uh, on thank you thank you for uh, being here and giving your time for us we really appreciate that and our people are looking forward to listen to you it's my pleasure good so just a short introduction it's not short pretty long because mari uh, johan johan is a senior person so he has worked in many places but i love to talk about his uh, work so he's a uh is the ceo of the african snake bite institute established just recently 10 years ago and he is the former curator of both fritz simon snake park in durban and transvaal snake park in halfway house as served on the crocodile specialist group of iucn was chair of the herpetological association of africa and uh, uh, of uh, south african reptile conservation assessment and guys you will not believe this he has done extensive rep reptile research in northern mozambique uganda malawi ba botswana south africa angola and namibia can you can you believe this um, johan all these are our dream dream places to visit some day before i die at least and i love to visit these places i can't believe that you worked in so many different places and uh, of course he's uh, he's affiliated with university of uh, witwatersrand and does most of his research with the villanova university uh, us and sam davis uh, university in texas so as a director of uh, african snake bite institute he also lectures in many places uh, creating awareness educating local people on snake bites of uh, and the snakes of africa um and the treatment definitely that's that's what the main concept uh, uh, that's why we are here uh, today so very interesting you guys should know this in honor of his contribution to the popular pathology and science two newly disco uh, discovered reptiles were named after him that's a gecko from western namibia and a worm lizard uh, from northern mozambique um uh, johan it's really a honor to have you on our uh, session here and uh, thank you very much for accepting our uh, invite and talking to our audience your presentation go ahead my pleasure gary i'm hoping that the next time you and i chat it's going to be in india exactly we're going to do this <laughs> yes So so Gary uh, there's a lot of things I want to talk to you about today but I thought what I what I'd start off with is just um one of my biggest drives obviously is educating people and uh, and what we find is that the the rural people the rural farmers uh those are the guys that get bitten mostly it's a it's a difficult uh, market to reach we have language barriers um so uh, some of what we do is going there and doing presentations uh, with interpreters um but what we've actually found is that um the best way for us to reach the masses is through social media and uh, over the last few years we've built up um about 400,000 people on our facebook pages we've um we've developed an app which i've just put up on the screen now which um in fact this week we've had our 100,000th download so this app is now with 100,000 people it has first aid on it it's free Uh, I think it's very important to say it's a free app, and um, if if anyone listening wants to download it, you go to uh, your Play Store, your Google Store, and you just uh, type in ASI Snakes. So this app has first aid measures. It has uh, easy IDs. We've even done stuff like local snakes. If you're in a specific town and you see a snake, you press on local snakes, and only the snakes of that area come up on the app. So it really is a very user-friendly app. that's really great the other thing that we've uh, that we've done again largely through social media is we produced uh, over 200 posters and these posters are free downloads from our website so you can um uh, you can get a poster for all the major cities major towns provinces regions national parks uh, we've done posters for school children we distribute those free 
And then uh, the next post that I want to show you is uh, one that we've done specifically for hospitals. Um, it shows the medically important snakes and it shows what venom they have, what anti-venom one needs for them and where the snakes occur. And these posters we make available free to hospitals and clinics. So any hospital or clinic that wants it, they print it in an A0 format, we supply those free. Good. Johan, can you press the F5 or have the full screen so that we get to see the whole? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best. I'm going to press F5 and see what happens. That's F5. Let's try Control F5. Okay. Uh, it's a okay, pity. There, there, uh, if I you can see get the anchor down here. Um, on the right. If I yeah, uh, you you press over yeah. here. That's it, yes. No, uh, next to that, I guess. Yes, perfect. Does that Got help it. you? Uh, but there's one more slide. Uh, yes. Where is that? Huh, I lost my uh, sound. Right next to the sound. Yeah, volume. Yeah, but I, I lose Gary if I do that. Just a full screen. Full screen, yeah. We're trying that, Gary. We're trying, but uh, we technically <laughs> challenge it here. <laughs> So I've got Bianca trying to work that out. We can chat away <laughs> while she sees if she gets that right. Yeah. I know we all have these situations, yeah. We are so comfortable with snakes, but when it comes to the presentation, the, yes, perfect, Bianca. Oh, there we go, perfect. perfect. Okay. That's, that's what we want to see, yeah. Thank you, Good. thank you, Bianca. So there's the so, poster. Right, my, my screen will disappear, so the whole, whole screen is yours now, yeah? I will remember you, don't worry. <laughs> go ahead. So this is these are the type of posters, and uh, so what's happening now also is, is another part of the of the app is we have a, an easy ID feature. So anyone who sees a snake can photograph it with the app. The picture comes to us, and we identify it. And what we are finding is that more and more medical doctors are making use of this. They uh, have a patient that comes in with a snake bite. Quite often, they might bring a, a dead snake with them, and uh, they photograph the snake, send it to us and we can assist in the whole process. And obviously it makes treatment a lot easier if you have a positive identification. Gary, are you there? Gary, are you there? Bianca? Okay. I've lost my sound. Ah, you're back, Gary. I'm, I'm, I'm here. So I'm, I'm not going to be on the screen. So I want you to be on the screen and the presentation. That's it. So I'll, I thought, I'm, I, thought I didn't hear you there for a moment. I lost my sound. Our, our, uh, uh, our viewers are watching your presentation. I'm right Excellent. here. I'll be okay. On right. So I'm going head. to, I'm going to continue. Um, so continue. In, in Southern Africa, we have about 173 different types of snakes. So we have a lot of snake diversity. Um, it's very complex because there's a lot of color variation. So identifying a snake is really difficult. So of these 173 odd snakes, 73 of them are completely non-venomous. So nearly half of our snakes have no venom whatsoever. So we have a large percentage of snakes that are not venomous. And a lot of these non-venomous snakes are common around human dwellings. Then we have what we call our back fang snakes. And only two of them are considered highly venomous, top left and bottom right, wormslung and twig snake. Fortunately, these snakes very rarely bite people. They docile, they live in trees, they don't really worry people. Mamas and cobras, a big, big problem. We've got, a, a, in the whole group of elapids, we have 26 snakes, and uh, we have highly venomous snakes like the black mamba, the cape cobra, bottom left, the green mamba, and uh, yeah, these snakes really are problematic. Fortunately, we don't see a lot of bites from these snakes. So black mamas worldwide are regarded as uh, extremely aggressive. That's not true. They avoid people if they can, but they do have a very, very potent venom. Adders, we have 16. And uh, the bottom left one, the puff adder, is a major problem. And um, top left, the night adder also bites a fair number of people. But we don't, because they have a cytotoxic venom, we don't see a lot of fatalities from these snakes. Five of our snakes are spitters. Um, you obviously have your fair share of them as well. 
And uh, the middle one, the Mozambique spinning cobra, is the, the most common. And the bottom right to the Runkels here in the Haifot, where we are around Johannesburg, uh, that is also uh, quite a common, a common snake around here. So these snakes bite and spit in there, obviously because they spit, they have a cytotoxic venom. Right, uh, 20 of our snakes we regard as potentially deadly. So those are the cobras, the mambas, the adders, wormslung, twig snake, and, uh, and the runkles. Um, but most of them very rarely feature in snake bite accidents. Uh, if we're looking at snake bite incidences, 90% plus of our bites are cytotoxic. There's a big spinning cobra, puffada, nighter, and we have a little snake called a stiletto snake. Bibrin stiletto snake. So these are the snakes that are biting most of the people. Their venoms are potent and do a lot of damage, but we don't see a lot of fatalities because these cytotoxic venoms are very slow in acting. We don't have your situation with uh, a lot of fatalities. So there you can see a typical puffado bite, a lot of pain, swelling, blistering. So our fatalities in, in South Africa, South Africa specifically, we have about 10 to 12 snake bite deaths a year. And these are largely caused by the black mamba and the Cape Cobra. Because these snakes have a neurotoxic venom, that venom can very rapidly affect one's breathing. So usually in an untreated case, if you have a bad bite from one of these snakes, you're looking at about one to seven hours before you have a, fat, a, a, fat, a fatal outcome. In severe cases, it might be sooner. So there's that Mozambique spitting cobra. This is a problem snake, and I, I don't know, I, I think I've heard you have similar problems with a the crate. These snakes often go into people's houses and bite people while they're asleep. So they really are a problem snake. Their venom is potently cytotoxic, does a lot of tissue damage, but we don't really see a lot of fatalities. Right, then the puffadder. Yeah, very abundant, widespread, occurs throughout most of Southern Africa. and. Um, the majority of bites are early evening when people accidentally stand on them. There's that little stiletto snake. It's a bit of a strange snake, uh, and it has these fangs that can sort of protrude out of, the, out of an open mouth. And uh, when people pick them up, they always get themselves bitten. Local damage only, but very, very, very painful. And of course, the night adders, uh, they're common in the eastern part of the country, the wetter part, and we have a fair number of people standing on them. As I said, the black mamas are not aggressive. You'll see they're fairly widespread. If you look at the, uh, look at the distribution map on the top right, uh, they get up to over three and a half meters in length, but they avoid people if one gives them half a chance. And then the Cape Cobra varies in color from near black to bright yellow, orange, speckled, light or dark brown, uh, the drier western half of, of Southern Africa. Um, also, they like most snakes, they'll try and get out of the way. But if you corner one, they stand their ground. They make a hood and uh, they bite quite readily. So they're a bit of a problem snake. So our, our efforts are obviously on, on prevention of snake bite. And one of the, I don't know, again, um, I'd like to hear your views, Gary, what the situation is in India. But in, in, South, in South Africa, we have a fair idea uh, what snakes are biting people, when they get bitten, who's getting bitten. But the one thing we don't have good data on is why people are getting bitten. Is it people in the field? Is it people standing on them? Is it people trying to kill them or catch them? So that we need to work on. Once we get those answers, um, I think one can do a heck of a lot more. So for instance, if a lot of people getting bitten are farmers accidentally standing on them barefoot, we could perhaps start an initiative and organize gun boots for thousands of farmers and see if that reduces uh, the number of snake bites. But we still have a lot to learn. So there you can see uh, typical cytotoxic bites from the Mozambique spitting cobra, uh, a lot of tissue damage. Um, obviously, the sooner we can get a victim to a hospital for uh, the proper treatment, the better, the less the tissue damage. And there you can see a typical puffada bite where we see the big blistering. So we have a very effective antivenom in South Africa. It covers 10 species. It's a polyvalent antivenom. So the mambas, cobras, the dangerous adders, the runcos, are all covered by the same antivenom. It's an expensive antivenom. It costs about uh, $100 a vial, and the average treatment, you need about 10, 15 vials per treatment 
depending on how severe the bite is. You might get away with six vials in a, in a puff at a bite, but let's call it around 10 vials. So yes, it's expensive. It's free in our state hospitals, but in private hospitals, it's an expensive exercise. So if you, if you have a bad uh, snake bite in South Africa and you go to a private hospital, you're probably in for about a 10,000 US dollar bill at least. So yeah, very, very, very expensive exercise. One of the many challenges we have is that a lot of our hospitals do not have antivenom in stock at all times. So this is another initiative that we're working on. We're hoping to, um, uh, through the African Snake Bite Institute, we're hoping to establish uh, about two dozen antivenom banks where antivenom will be available uh, 24 hours a day. That's pretty much the presentation, Gary. So back to you. Perfect. That uh, works. Yeah. So, of course, the, the questions are flowing in. Uh, we can ask those questions one by one. If you're, if you're on. Yeah, sure. I'm ready for them. Good. Uh, wait, wait, the first question. So the first question by Srinivas, uh, in case of absence of a snake picture with just the uh, clinical symptoms, in bracket he says many symptoms overlap with species, how do we identify the snake? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a problem. So the bottom line is that uh, in, in the Southern African context, I'd say in about probably 80% of snake bites, we have no idea what snake bit the person, no idea whatsoever. So we exactly. basically, we look at symptoms. So um, I consult with a lot of medical doctors, uh, especially those in the high risk areas. So we might ask a few basic questions. How did it happen? Give us a basic description. We look at the symptoms and um, of course we know what occurs in those areas. So we know what the common, what the common problem snakes are. Because the antivenom is a polyvalent, uh, if the patient has a very bad, let's say, puff out a bite, spinning cobra bite, black mamba bite, cape cobra bite, the treatment's the same. It doesn't really matter. It's the same antivenom. Yeah, we have, we have the polyvalent or the, the cocktail of venom is used to, to make one particular exactly. antivenom so that you don't need to think about molovenant or identify the species. Similar. Yep in India not, yeah not that important now what's what's interesting is we find that about four out of ten snake bite victims that are hospitalized have no symptoms either a, a non-venomous snake or a dry bite and about one out of ten need antivenom okay that's good so you said the antivenom in your government hospital is free correct wow that's 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 good that's good yeah so yeah, he's asking about the, what about fatalities from snouted cobra? So snouted cobras, for some reason, it's one of our biggest cobras. They reach uh, two and a half meters in length. We often find them um, on small holdings. We find them if, where people keep chickens. They come to, to raid for chicken eggs. But bites from them are extremely rare. Very, very rare. For some reason, they just don't bother to bite people. And in the last few years, I know of two fatalities only in the, in the last five odd years uh, from snouted cobras. Again, snout, so the, the black mamba and cape cobra venom is predominantly neurotoxic. So you see this um, uh, severe effect on breathing. Snouted cobra venom is a mixture. It's a bit of neuro and cyto, so you have a lot more time in most instances. Okay. So he wants to know which one is more important, the spitting cobras or non-cobras? What do you mean by non-cobras? Have fatality non from more from spitting cobras or the non-cobras? Maybe he's, ta he's talking about black mambas and green mambas. Which one is more potent? Are there any species of non-spitting cobras in Africa? Yeah, I, I, we have a lot in, in South Africa. So our, um, well, our, our, our forest cobras don't spit, our snouted cobras don't spit, the cape cobras don't spit, and cheetahs don't spit. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, the cape cobra and black bomber account for most fatalities. They are the biggest problem snakes because of these predominantly neurotoxic venoms. The other cobras, we do see bites, but we don't see a lot of fatalities from them. And a snake like the runcals, which is also a spitting snake, it's an elapid, 
It looks like a cobra, but it's not one. Um, we haven't had a fatality in about 40 years. Wow, that's interesting. So uh, we 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 have more fatalities and more snake bites in the world. You know that's why we <laughs> we have the half the uh, snake bites in the world. You know the yep, capacity of snake bites in the world is just India. Yeah. So so one Gary, <laughs> one thing that one thing that one mustn't lose sight of, and I'm sure it's a major problem in uh, in India as well, is we, we we tend to sometimes ignore the socioeconomic impact of a snake bite. Exactly. So you have a farmer who supports a dozen people. Uh, they live off the land. Uh, he gets bitten by a puffer, or he loses a hand, and he can't farm anymore. And suddenly you have a dozen people with no income. And that's a big exactly. problem. Yeah. Same situation in, in India. We have a similar situation. So most of the snake bites uh, are uh, to the farmers who are working in the paddy field. So that's a big problem. Right, so the Indranil, Indranil Kulkarni has a question. What is your opinion on using animal tissue culture and equine cell lines to culture anti-venom? Gosh, yes, that? that's, a, that's a very tough question. So um, yeah. a, a, lot of, a, a lot of the folks out there will know, uh, will know that the World Health Organization has declared uh, snake bite a neglected tropical disease. And their exactly. aim is to reduce uh, fatalities by 50% in the next few years. Part of that, a lot of money has been put into researching new antivenoms. And there are phenomenal uh, initiatives. There are great scientists working on new antivenoms. Um, I, I would love to see better and more efficient antivenoms and cheaper antivenoms, but it's not going to happen in a year or two. It's, uh, you know, there's synthetic antivenoms being looked at. Um, and, and as I said, a lot of great initiatives, but um, I don't see um, I don't see major solutions in the short term. So yeah, exactly. I'd support I'd support any anti venom that's developed. Sure. So another friend, his name is Forest Friend. Are there snakes which have mitotoxin venom in Africa? Yeah, I think I think the important thing uh, about snake venoms that all venoms are complicated cocktails. None of them are straightforward. So when you start really analyzing them, you're going to find a lot of components. And there's a pretty good chance uh, that some of our snakes might have myotoxins, but they don't, they're not, pro they're not uh, prominent. Um, they don't feature very, very prominently when we, look at, um, when we look at treating patients. So we also, I mean, we have the yellow-bellied sea snake off our coast, and um, that also has myotoxins in its venom. Exactly, yeah. Good. So another question. Um, just when you promote she's asking uh that's i think it's for me <laughs> is there any app to identify indian snakes both urban and rural yes Tejeshwini, uh, if you go on uh, indiasnakeorg.com i think they have a, a app uh, for identification of indian snakes and we at kcr we also designed an app to identify uh, uh, about 42 species of snakes from western guts that's central western guts where we have our field station Agumbe. So please do download these and they definitely help you a lot. And uh, what is this? Oh, I lost it. Wow, so many questions. Go on. Do you have time for that? Of course, I have plenty of time. Hey, good. Yeah, that's good. You finish your presentation pretty fast so that we can have more questions and more that, interaction. That, yeah? that was my plan. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. Okay. So, Adrit Pradeep, he wants to know, she, he says he's not a supporter of wildlife trade. And he wants to know, do people catch them and import them? Or are they killed by people believing myths? Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a nice question. You know, we, we do have, in fact, this morning's newspaper has a big article that I, uh, that I was the cause of on the legal trade of reptiles from South Africa. It's a big issue. We do have smuggling. There are, you know, it's a, it's a worldwide problem. Uh, traditional beliefs, uh, yes, a lot of people have um, a lot of traditional beliefs and they will kill snakes on site. But that applies to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Afrikaans. A lot of uh, farmers are Afrikaans. Afrikaans farmers, by and large, if they see a snake, they take a shotgun and they shoot it. So we always educating them. And, and what's very encouraging is with a lot of people through our programs, we, we teach a lot of people how to safely capture and remove venomous snakes with 
the right equipment with snake tongues. And what we are finding is more and more farmers are purchasing snake tongues from us. So we're really making good progress in this regard. Yes, that's good. Yes, uh, uh, guys, you should check out his website and Facebook page. Uh, Johan does conduct a lot of camps and workshops, the snake training workshop, just like we do in India here. And uh, that helps a lot. You know, we have to have many, many snake rescuers. The locals who live there, uh, people, the forest department, or uh, the person who's ready to do it smartly without taking risks, it's very, very easy to capture the snake and put them back into the wild, you know? So this is very important. Killing is not a solution. You kill one snake, the next day you'll find another snake from a neighboring farm. So it's better to have your own snake, which you grew up in your farm for 10 years or five years. He knows the, the whole place. That's what I tell people, right? He knows your farmhouse, he's, he knows your vehicle, he knows where your kids are playing, your swimming pool, everything. So he lived there with you. So do not remove him or kill him. So the new new snake will occupy the place. So good. Check out his Facebook page. So Rajasimha has a question. Rajasimha is a friend of our friends, uh, Frederick. Your friend, Frederick. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> so have you audited urban locales in um, South Africa uh, with high snake di density and how do you ensure snakes don't get killed and people are safe? We just spoke about that. Yeah, Gary, it's, uh, you know, one, one thing that, that we don't know, and uh, it's a very, very difficult study to do, is if you start looking at uh, population numbers, um, nowhere in Africa do we have good data for any snake on how big a population is. Exactly. You know, people will say, People will say, oh, last year I, I saw just about no snakes. This year there's snakes everywhere. They don't become more. They just, there's some uh, environmental condition that makes them come out of their hiding places. Uh, but exactly. the populations are pretty stable. Yes, exactly. There are snakes there. And it depends how often you bump into them or, or how much time you spend in the farm, right? Yeah. What, yeah. I get the, uh, the same situation, right? People these days, they don't stay in the farm. They stay in the city. And they say, oh, Absolutely. I'm... I don't see the snakes these days. I ask him, where do you live? Oh, I live in city. Then how do you expect to see a snake here? <laughs> he was young. He used to walk to the school, right? Uh, and that's the time he has seen many snakes. Now he's moved out of that farm. He's gone to a bigger city, and he thinks he hasn't seen snakes anymore. So it's all up to you, right? Yes, okay. The other, the other important thing, Gary, is that you probably never see more than 4 or 5% of the snakes in an area. Exactly. So the few that you see, that's nothing. There are many, nothing. many more, but they are super intelligent, they're successful, they're secretive, and we just don't see them. Exactly. So we have personally experienced, I'm sure people in South Africa also working on black mambas and pythons, you know, Alexander was working. We did this yeah. elementary project on king cobras, and we followed them, you know, at just like 10 meters away from the snake. He was so comfortably moving around the village, he knows where exactly he has to go, where exactly he has to cross the stream, uh, the road, everything he's sorted out because he grew up there. He knows the track. So they, they somehow they coexist with us. They don't yes, want to absolutely. Us, right? they avoid us. Like you said, they're smart enough to live their own life. I think we should yeah. smarter or we should grow up, uh, you know, be more smarter to live with them. That's what we're trying to do, right? Right. So Forest friend has one more question. He says, can you share symptoms on humans for neurotoxin and cytotoxin? That's a large. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a nice, it's a nice question. So with yeah. a, what we find with the cytotoxins is you get a bite and then slowly the pain starts. It's not instant. It takes a while. And the, let's say it's a bite on the hand. The hand starts swelling up. Uh, the pain starts spreading. The swelling starts spreading. The more severe the bite, the quicker the, the swelling. And then after a few hours, you might start developing blisters. And let's say by the time you get to a hospital two hours later, half your arm is swollen. Um, if it's a severe bite and you get antivenom, the problem now is the antivenom can't get into that part of the, of the swollen limb. So the chances of tissue damage are very, very big. So with cytotoxic bites, it's very important that you do absolutely nothing, no bandages, no cutting, sucking. You do nothing, no tourniquets and you get to a hospital as quickly as you can. 
Exactly. The neurotoxins are quite different because the, the onset of symptoms can be dramatic. So what we find with a, like with a black mamba bite, within minutes, your lips go numb. You have like pins and needles on your lips. Uh, a few minutes later, you slowly start battling to, to uh, swallow. Your tongue is getting paralyzed. Um, you uh, speak with slurred, uh, slurred speech. Um, and as you become progressively weaker, so the next thing that happens is your eyes go droopy, your pupils dilate, and these are signs that you're getting weaker and weaker. And, of course, then the big danger is that you start batting to breathe. You find it more and more difficult to breathe, and um, the moment your breathing stops, uh, you have a few minutes left before you die. Thank you. That, that was good. I mean, you know, in a brief. But... Uh... Uh, there's a there's lot of uh, things to be considered. Uh, please do read more about that and take proper precaution. So yeah. um, Anuradha has a question. How can we make out whether the venomous or a non-venomous bite? You know, which snake has bitten by looking at the snake bite? Will you be able to say whether it's a dry bite or whether it's a venomous or non-venomous snake bite? So uh, the appearance of a bite does not tell us a heck of a lot. And um, every snake bite is completely unique. We can't take 10 black mamba bites and treat them in the same manner because everyone's going to be absolutely unique. So, the, so we can't tell from a bite. Um, it could be two nice, big, distinct fang punctures. It could be a little scratch. They can both be equally as bad. So the important thing, again, is the doctor's going to look at symptoms. You, so we prefer you to be in a hospital for at least 24 hours that they can monitor you, look at your blood works and uh, look at your oxygen levels and see what's happening. Exactly. So Jagdish has a question. What would be the first aid when there is a snake bite before taking to the hospital? Tough so, question. <laughs> a very tough time. question. <laughs> but, um, it, uh, you know, first aid, the whole idea of first aid is to assist the patient until you get to the next level of medical care. And by far the most important first aid in, in, in the Southern African context is to get to a hospital. And what we find is that 99% plus of people that have a snake bite and go to a hospital survive the bite. So if you, in most instances, do absolutely nothing, and get to a hospital, you're doing a good thing. The, the danger in the Southern African context is those snakes with the potent neurotoxic venom, the black mamba and the Cape Cobra. And now things become a bit complex. So then we can start looking at things like mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Um, you, you can read up about pressure immobilization. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's not, it, it's, it really becomes very, very complex. And what I suggest, if you want to learn a bit more about what we do here, all of these first aid me measures are on the app. So if you download the app, ASI Snakes, you can see exactly what we say about first aid, what to do and what not to do. Exactly. So uh, Jagdish, I still, uh, I would, uh, we are doing a session day after tomorrow on Saturday, Sunday, but that uh, session is full, but we, we're planning to do one more very soon, maybe next month. Uh, I would still suggest like, Johan mentioned you have to read, you have to learn more about the, the first aid because a wrong first aid can kill a person. And uh, even here, we would suggest the same thing. Just go to the hospital. First thing you do is go to the hospital. Let the doctor take care. Let him check. Let him let him uh, take a decision whether there's envenomation or no. Just hang around there for some time and then everything is fine. Then you can come back home. Don't wait at home or don't try to do anything what you learned 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Uh, things are changing rapidly now. So do send your email ID so we will share you more information on that. Good. So Gary, just, Gary, just one other point on that. Yes. Um, I just want to caution people. Please be yes. very careful of Google. A exactly. lot of people yes. think that Google is this wonderful source of information. Google finds anything on any website. So whatever rubbish people write on their website, Google is going to find. Stay exactly. away from Google. Yes. Th that's why... Uh, people like Johan and me, we conduct a regular workshops so that you get to know what is right, what is wrong. Yes, doing your homework is always fine, but do attend camps and workshops when we conduct such seminars or talks. So it's important to know what is right as of now. What do we do to survive? Yeah, so I 
completely agree with you, Jan. Yeah, so Matan Raj has a question. How educated the local people are on first aid measures to follow before reaching out to the hospital? I think this plays vital role between life and death. Yes, this is a major problem because uh, what you find is that the rural people that have less education obviously know the least about first aid. And then all the, all the traditions come in. Uh, they make use of traditional healers. Um, and that is problematic because by the time we see a patient in the hospital, a lot of damage has been done. There is no traditional remedy. There is no traditional remedy whatsoever that helps with a serious snake bite. Um, I said earlier on, nine out of 10 people don't need antivenom. So nine out of 10 patients that go to a traditional healer are going to recover. But that one that needs the antivenom, that person is going to die. So yeah. we really uh, encourage people and we spend a lot of time with traditional healers as well to make sure that snake bite victims go to hospital. It's good. That's true. Yeah. I think even we have to spend more time with the traditional healer in our part. We hardly discuss or talk to them. Uh, we have to tell them what is happening. Good. So there is, uh, uh, he says, that species usually presents a greater number of medical complications despite the use of antivenom. And in case of bite by twig snake, snake, the treatment is performed. What, did, did you understand? Okay, I don't, I, don't, I don't quite understand the question, but I'm going to answer it. Um, I think another popular, we, we have problems with our antivenom is that a certain percentage of patients have a severe allergic reaction when they receive antivenom and some of them go into anaphylaxis. Now, anaphylaxis is quite scary because what happens is that the patient's blood pressure drops, their throat closes up and eventually their heart stops beating. But it is a condition that medical doctors can manage. So they'll be prepared for it. They'll have adrenaline ready. They know exactly what to do. We don't see patients dying from antivenom. That's a myth. A lot of people say, yes, antivenom kills more. But that's not true at all. Um, so anaphylaxis is a problem or allergic reactions, but it is manageable. As for the twig snake, uh, there are a few different species and subspecies in Southern Africa. And in South Africa, we've never had a death from a twig snake. Further north, there have been very, very few deaths. I think part of the reason, um, first of all, they just don't bite people. But if people do get bitten, the, the, the northern species get a bit bigger. Ours get up to about 1.4 meters. Those get up to about 1.7 meters, so they have more venom. There is no antivenom for, for the twig snake. So in a severe bite, they might give you blood transfusions. They might supplement your platelets. But the bottom line is that there is no treatment. So if you have a really severe bite from a twig snake, there's a likelihood you won't survive. Good. We have one more question from Priyanka. She says, she's asking, how are snakes perceived in Africa? Is it same like India, as India? Yeah, I think it's pretty much the same thing. I think... Yeah. Um, I think snakes have always suffered from a bad press. So here exactly. in, in Southern Africa, you have the Bible stories, you have all the other myths that are passed on from generation to generation. And uh, we, all grew, we all grew up terrified of snakes because of the stories we heard from our uncles and aunts and grandparents. And um, a lot of, of the majority of what is said about snakes is untrue. It's just, uh, these are just uh, fables. They're just not true at all. Um, so from a from a safety point of view, in, in the Southern African context, I always say to people, and even if it's children that are involved, if you encounter a snake, all you have to do is retreat five paces. That's it, five paces. If you walk along and there's a black mamba with its mouth open, if there's a Cape Cobra rearing up, back off five paces and you are perfectly safe and you cannot get bitten. That's exactly. it. Easy. Very easy. Perfect. So one of our students, Indranil, is asking, and research avenues for the same. Do you have any research avenues? <laughs> yeah, research is a tough Student one. You know, uh, the, the problem was always funding. We all need money to study. We need money to do exactly. projects. Uh, most of my research I do with uh, Professor Aaron Bauer from Villanova in Pennsylvania in the USA. Uh, but Professor Bauer is the top herpetologist in the world. And he gets a lot of money for research. So I piggyback onto him and his research. 
Um, yeah. And that works out really well. Locally, it's very, very difficult to get funding for research. Exactly. Aaron is quite, uh, Aaron Boer is quite uh, popular even in India uh, with the Gecko work. And a lot of our yes. friends weeks, work with Aaron and uh, he's a great uh, person. Yeah. I've met him a couple of times and been interacted. Yeah. Good. So the next question, Saswat, how will antivenom cost effective for people of India and Africa where most of bitten cases in rural area? Our uh, traditional tech used by African tribes like Indian tribes. I think we discussed that. Yes, so, we did. Uh, now, look, antivenom is a problem. It's like any uh, it's like any form of medicine. You know, um, everything costs money. If you if you have a severe car crash and you end up in ICU with broken bones, it's a very expensive exercise for you to be treated. And with antivenom, it's the same. I think one of the biggest problems, uh, as the World Health Organization has highlighted now, it's a neglected problem it's severely neglected you know if you um if you uh, look at in south africa we'll have a vehicle accident with two taxis and there's 16 people dead one accident in the whole year we have maybe 12 fatalities from snake bite so snake bite is not very high up on the radar it's not uh, killing a lot of people so it gets very little money good uh i lost uh yeah. Anyway, I'll just start wherever. Krishna Chaitanya is asking you, is there any psychological effects from a snake bite? Any injury related to brain? Yes, I think uh, I think this is something else that is also often neglected. We see a lot of long-term damage after snake bites, physically and mentally. Um, I'm dealing with a case now where a man had a bad snake bite, he had a finger amputated, he had to have, have his gallbladder removed, and he, he's now uh, not doing well at all. He's spending a lot of time with psychologists, he's not doing well at work, he's not doing well at home. Um, so yes, we do see a lot of psychological damages uh, resulting from snake bite. Um, we had a, a young girl who had a bite on her hand, and um, eventually she also had a lot of operations, uh, ampute a finger was amputated, and um, she's a year or two back in school now. She has horrible scars on her hand. It's a, it's a tough life then. Yeah. Good. Katerina. Katerina has a question. Uh, there are allergies to insect bites in any way related to allergies to snake, snake venom? Ah, nice question again. No, not at all. So yeah. if, you, if you have a history of uh, allergies, let's say you're allergic to shellfish or to dairy products that has nothing to do with snake bites and exactly. the way that these severe allergies work uh, if we're looking at snake venom it has to do with exposure to venom so you're not going to get your first snake bite and have a severe allergic reaction but uh, for someone like gary who works with snakes and every time he cleans a snake cage there's some residue of venom in the cage he can become sensitized over time and uh, right. Eventually, if he gets a snake bite, he can have a very bad allergic reaction. Exactly. So, and she also suggests, or she's pointing out, Google Scholar is a much more reliable source than Google. Which, right? Absolutely. Yes, we agree with you, Catherine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, is there any vaccination kind of medicines to avoid snake bite? You know, I think we had a, a discussion in the previous uh, talk yes. as well. People want to know whether we have any anti-vaccine, like anti-rabies, you know, when people who are yep. working with the dogs in the kennel, you know, so they have this anti-rabies shot. Can we take, like you and me, take a Unfortunately shot? not. <laughs> Unfortunately not. not the, nothing yes. has been uh, developed yet. And I think on this subject, another very important thing, so there's no vaccination, there's no medication that you can take beforehand. But in the same sort of, uh, in, the, in, in the same con uh, context, there is no snake repellent that works to keep snakes away. So all the stories you hear about using certain plants, old oil, diesel, toilet cleaners, whatever, there is nothing that repels snakes. You have snakes in your area because you have good habitat for them, you have food for them, and that's exactly. why they're there. Exactly. So, yeah. So there is no anti, anti, anti uh, what is that, uh, anti-vaccine where you... Like anti-rabies, you can take it and just jump on the snake. Don't do that. You know, nothing works. So we have one more question from Madhu, Madhu Sudan. He says, Johan, I love your dressing style. <laughs> I think maybe they, what do you have? Yes. 
Yeah. It's Bianca that traces me. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, what is the statistics of snake bites in South Africa? What kind of government compensation does one get if one dies of snake bite or particularly or partially disabled? Okay, so if we look at if we look at snake bites in South Africa, we probably have about um, around four thousand snake bite incidences a year. Um, of those, about um, less than a thousand end up in hospital. Um, a fair amount of morbidity. We must never underestimate that. As I mentioned, ten to twelve fatalities. No compensation whatsoever if you are killed or maimed by a snake. Yeah. So in, in in India we have this system. If the person uh, gets bitten in his house, that's it, within the village, right? Uh, so he might get compensation if you go to the doctor or uh, to the department. But if he gets bitten outside his house, or let's say in the paddy field or in 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 the wild, in the forest, no compensation, even for elephant or tiger, anything. So yeah, the point is, you ventured into the forest, so you are in domain so you get by this animal so there's no problem so, very interesting which makes sense. yeah yeah good so uh adrit has one more interesting question if you are asking about if snakes can live with without the venom they will keep on producing venom through their lives i think so he's asked basically asking so the way the way the way snake venom works is it's quite similar to saliva in our mouths if yeah. I spit, more saliva forms in my mouth. Snakes have pretty much the same system. And if a venomous snake, let's say one of a cobra bites someone, it doesn't mean that it uses all its venom or most of its venom. There will be venom yeah. left for more bites. And what we find is that in snake bite instances, quite often a snake bite might be quite mild or you'll have no venom. But if you let that snake bite you a second time, the second time around the snake says, listen, I warned you and you didn't listen the first time. Now I'm going to show you. So second bites are always worse. Yeah. They're going to pump in all their venom because they're pissed off. They're angry. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So there's one more interesting question. Sorry. Uh, two more last questions. That's it. Uh, some animals, birds are immune to snake venom. Those that aren't snakes, can you explain about them? Well, you know, when we, when we make anti-venom, it's... Uh, it's a process of uh, immunization. So what we do is we take a bit of snake venom. We In South Africa, we use horses to make anti-venom. We'll inject a bit of venom into the horse. It starts building up antibodies, inject a bit more, and over a nine-month period, we hyper-immunize the horse. Then the horse is totally immune. You can inject snake venom into it. It does nothing. So some animals have a natural immunity. Um, a lot of mongooses and possums in the USA and hedgehogs um they're just um they're immune so the snake venoms don't affect them so it's a it's a natural protection and this has obviously been looked at by a lot of researchers to find out if there isn't a an easy way that we can harvest this immunity but yes. it's not that easy yep sorry i was almost trying to wind up but uh Deerish has reminded i've asked a question please address that so i'm going back and looking for it so he says, since the venom composition changes due to geographical distribution of the same species, is it a good idea to have multiple venom collection center and produce AVS, that is anti-venom serum locally? We discussed this but, at the yeah. time. Yes. I, I cannot yeah. tell you how much I'm enjoying these questions and being in, in this forum. Um, <laughs> so yes, the venoms might vary geographically or they might not. It's a very intensive study to look at that. And one of the suggestions that I've made to our uh, anti-venom producers is that the 10 species of snakes that we use for making anti-venom, we should genetically map them and then make sure that when we get venom, we have a good spread from throughout the range so that you're covering Kenya because our, our anti-venom is used all over Africa. So ideally, if we're making anti-venom for mambas, we need a bit of venom from throughout the range. So that's a, a very, very good point. Um, it gets more complicated. Uh, what we find in, in South Africa is that puff adder bites are largely juvenile puff adders. So juvenile snakes and adults, their venoms can vary because they adapt, often adapt to their prey. So ideally, if we're making anti-venom for puff adder bites, 
we should have juvenile puffer venom in the mix as well, exactly. which we don't do at this stage. Completely, I agree with that. Anyway, good. So uh, Deepak, Deepak wants to visit, he's planning to visit South Africa next year. He wants to prepare himself. So how do I get ready for it? Deepak, before going to South Africa, definitely you can uh, part of our workshops, which happens right here and learn about cobras, which, which are similar to their cobras. Of course, our cobras don't spit, their cobras spit. And of course, the other venomous, non-venomous snakes. And then go there, of course, meet uh, Johan and learn from him about their snakes in one of his workshops. And then try to do anything you want to do. Till then, I would suggest do not try. Even in case if you visit South Africa, don't try these things. Yeah. <laughs> Bring a lot of money with so you can have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Now, Garya, thank you for the live session. I request you to please share the best first aid method. Yeah. Again, uh, in case of someone, so get a hospital. Get a hospital. It's easy. Yeah. The first. Uh, there's no first best first aid method for, uh, and universally, each species has its own. We've already discussed this, Sano. Please go to the hospital as early as possible. Let the doctor take a call. And of course, you have to know which snake you got bitten. Even if you don't know, just go to the hospital. Don't try to do anything which you're not aware of or which you read on Google. Don't try those things. Yeah, good. Good. So I think we, we are done with most of the questions. If there are anything specific questions, we'll be happy to send these questions to Johan and get the answers from him, him about the African snakes or African situation perspective uh, and we will share his email ID in case if you need it and please feel free to get in touch with him if you guys go to Africa and uh, that's it collaboration collaboration networks we love to do that and someday I hope uh, Johan will visit India he was supposed to Definitely. visit but uh, due to pandemic or uh, corona he couldn't do it maybe next year he will do it and we might have a live session right here where he might give a talk similar talk to the audience directly no online classes so you get to see him how interesting he is to talk to him whole day not just the session I've, I've spent enough time with him so it's really interesting thank you thank you johan it was really great and we appreciate your time and uh, accepting our invite and doing this session for us on the great My pleasure, day. gary it was wonderful thank you we must do this again thank you appreciate it thank you, you take care you'll catch up soon yes. Bye. Bye. thanks thank you